Welcome to this episode on manifesting divine relationships with support from the heart opening energetics of Egypt. I'm so excited to be co creating this episode with my beloved husband, life partner, Dr. Friedemann Schaub. Hey, Friedemann, so glad to have you back on the podcast. Well, so nice to be here with you. I'm excited. And you are really going to love this episode if you recognize that it is time to really move out of some of the old operating systems with relationships and to call in even more refined relationships in your personal, your professional life with yourself, with others, with source as well as rejuvenate, renew, refresh those long-term relationships. So we are going to dive into some really juicy topics, including how you can amplify your divine relationships and have deeply nourishing connections, community, without the hypervigilance or fear of being seen or uh, settling for less kind of getting in the way. So let's start talking about what are divine relationships and why are they so important? Well, I think all relationships are important simply because this is how we are of service. This is how we are experiencing a a level of our existence that we cannot do on our own. I think relationships are challenging because they ask us to adjust, to grow and to evolve like you and I have certainly experienced in the last 20 plus years. And I find, you know, relationships are also what we are really meant to have in order to see each other as teachers, as students. I always find like the most challenging relationships can also the, be the most rewarding ones because they are the ones that really make us look inside and ask ourselves the questions, you know, how can I meet this person with more compassion? How can I have better boundaries? How can I actually get out of my own defensiveness and see what is there for me to learn from this person? So. Relationships are ultimately one of the cornerstones of our existence. And unfortunately, we are not really necessarily told how to have good and how to have divine relationships. I mean, there should be a class in school that says how to have a good relationship, but it doesn't exist. So we are rather learning biology and math and not necessarily one of the essential aspects of life. Well, and here we are in this podcast uh, to be talking about divine relationships. And I really love the word divine because it points to source. It points to the word extraordinary, that we're really co-creating these extraordinary relationships. And, you know, of course, uh, we we both have our unique ways that we assist our clients to really amplify areas of their lives, including relationships. And, and yet there's that recognition of uh, the larger context that we're having this conversation in, that there really is this shift from the old paradigm of survival consciousness. I know uh, for those of you who may not have tuned into the episode that Freedom and I did uh, for your book, The Empowerment Solution, How to Overcome the Fear of Visibility, this really it tag teams well into that. Uh, and, and yet that shift from survival patterns or separation consciousness into unity really is that shift from the me to the we and what the guides often call individualized oneness. So especially as we're on our path and uh, we love to talk about mission and I really feel like our mission is supported by other individuals. And so that can mean that it's really essential as well that we move out of like the lone wolf syndrome or feeling like we have to do it our own. So let's talk about like, what are some of those common um, old survival consciousness patterns that we may use consciously or unconsciously or accidentally to hold others and source and even ourselves at arm's length? I mean, one of the patterns I certainly uh, have been expert in is the pattern of believing that 
I have to do it all on my own <laughs> because I didn't trust anyone. So if you grow up already thinking that you cannot really rely on other people's support or that uh, they will not really show up for you, whether you have been with parents that were busy and maybe a little neglectful with yourself or whether it was a chaotic household you grew up in or whatever it is there, there's just this belief if I don't do it, it's not going to get done. And there is probably also me who can do it the best. So I was in that belief system. And uh, it just makes you like all beliefs only look at that, what you believe the, is true. So if you are having 10 people helping you, and one person may not do a really good job, well, your belief is already confirmed. See, I cannot rely on anyone. See, I have to do it on my own. So the nine people are pretty much ignored. All the others that did a good job. So that is a very common one. And another common one is that we don't really deserve to be in a relationship that's loving, supportive, accepting, because we're not really that good enough. And in order to deserve it, we have to give to others in order to receive back. And that's the classic pleaser helper pattern, which is always the desire to or the the need to give more than actually to expect to receive in return. And that's a very imbalanced relationship. And, and maybe if I may, the third one that comes to mind is the one that is a fear of letting people get close, the fear of intimacy, the fear of being maybe exposed or found out or getting attached to someone and only getting hurt afterwards. So there is this push pull on the one hand is a desire to let someone in. But then there's this hypervigilance of looking for any kind of signs that this person may actually not mean well, or that this person is not really reliable or trustworthy. And so there is, especially with intimate relationships, then this self-fulfilling prophecy where we are so negative towards the person we are with. We are constantly either suspecting or uh, judging or nagging so that at some point the person says, you know what, I'm out of here. And then we again get the confirmation that, see, no one can be with me. It's no one is really available to me, I always have to be alone. So I always think like we have to not only look at what the what the relationships were about, but really also see what's the belief system underneath that may have prevented us from having these divine relationships. Mm. Yeah, and, and as we're talking, you know, what's coming to me is, is the that sense of like upper limits, right? Because a lot of you tuning in here, you may already be having like good relationships, really good relationships. And you may have some that are wobbly. And yet we're talking about how can you have really aligned, coherent, uh, divine, extraordinary relationships. And so there are these intimacy ceilings, not only in romantic, intimate uh, partnerships, yet also these intimacy ceilings that we may bump up against and that's really what you just named there and of course like as we connect a lot in divine transmissions with highly sensitive empathic uh, difference makers practitioners healers uh, coaches that there can be also this this question of how can i be with myself while being with somebody else. And I think you just talked about that where it can feel very much either or, like either I can be giving to someone or I could be receiving from someone. And one of the paradigm shifts about the we is really that there is that simultaneity of gifting, having and receiving. So I feel like another one, and then let's kind of move into uh, Egypt, but another one, is that um, you know kind of where where we're we're hanging back or not being visible, and that can happen also really in the practitioner role. Like it can feel like there's a lot of intimacy that's happening because you know we're we're really connected to folks and folks are sharing deep level, especially when we're making a difference. And yet that in and of itself 
although extraordinary can be another mask or another way of hiding if those are the only types of intimate relationships. So anything else on this before we segue into the energetics of Egypt and how our experiences in Egypt and the heart opening energies of Egypt and the guides can really help manifest divine relationships? Well, I do feel that it's important that the divine relationship is also the divine relationship with yourself. So if you want to have really supportive, loving, juicy, unconditional relationships, but you don't like yourself, you don't really embrace yourself, you don't accept yourself, it's going to be very difficult for you to embrace the presence of others because you either compare yourself or you're in your mind look for a reason that tells you well maybe they have ulterior motives or whatever those things are so when we talk about divine relationships it's also important to realize well maybe what you want to manifest is also and maybe primarily a divine relationship with yourself and what that can mean is also that you see your own divine within that you can see your perfection within that you can see that at the core there is goodness there is light there is your authentic truth and especially these days and this is talking about mission really my mission to help people to come back from this distraction mode from being either completely focused on whatever happens outside of us and focused on whatever we are supposed to be and what others are doing that we also should be doing so that we don't even have an awareness of what is really me and what do I want and what is, you know, my truth. Or we are so struggling with ourselves. We are so hyper focused on our anxieties and our insecurities and our depression. We have that focus so much on our shadow or darkness or struggles, whatever you want to call it. I would say it's more our small selves that are just needing some love and compassion. We have so much focus on that that we don't really see anything else anymore. So we identify ourselves with our flaws and not with the wholeness of who we are. So both is really something we have to also incorporate. You know, we have to see that, yes, we need more attention and we also need to have more love and support for these aspects of us that feel somehow not integrated, not lovable, that feel scared, want to hide out and and also bring them into our wholeness in order for us to have a loving and divine relationship with ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that really feels like one of the keys or the pro tips uh, to really underscore to highlight that I know that the guides talk about as well in terms of, you know, we're already, there already is separation. So including the slower vibrational thoughts or feelings or emotions or perceptions that we have of ourselves into the wholeness rather than trying to get rid of them or ignore them. And at the same time, I feel like also what you're saying, and this is where I feel like we're kind of switching the direction in the conversation where we've laid the context of, what may be some pitfalls or uh, patterns, cellular memories that we have where we hold intimacy at arm's length, but then to also recognize that there's actually more to garner when we focus on co-creation, when we focus on joy and love and community and really being in this new paradigm of relationships. So I feel like that's kind of a two-pronged uh, really potent combination of simultaneously all of us is welcome from the slowest vibration to the highest vibration. We don't want to fire our star players. Uh, they just need perhaps some new job descriptions or to, to uh, complete old uh, patterns or overlays or operating systems, but then also go like, wow, there's a lot that's already going well. There's a lot of resourceness. There's a lot of uh, also experiences that we can pull from to say, well, this relationship is amazing, or I showed up in this now moment in a different way. 
So you and I have been uh, traveling to Egypt since the early 2000s. We've had the opportunity to bring, I don't know, more than a dozen groups to Egypt. And our, we're going back in February 2024. We're co-leading this journey. The theme is about manifesting divine relationships with self, with source, and with others. And uh, I want to talk about kind of the magic of Egypt as it relates to heart opening. Now, of course, from my perspective, one of the first ways we can easily talk about that is also how the Egyptian pantheon, the gods and goddesses, really represent these archetypal energies that we have within ourselves. So Isis is very much about love and magic. And so as we open a connection to Isis, we also are opening that connection within ourselves to love and to magic or Thoth, Thoth, Toth, the God of infinite knowledge is uh, that inner wisdom. So as we open to and connect with, uh, with Toth, we're accessing that inner wisdom within. So yeah, Egypt, relationships, uh, let's dive in. Well, I mean, what first comes to mind is that um, I think it was our first trip to Egypt where I ask you in Sekhmet's temple, pretty much out of the blue, to marry me. And uh, all Great you could guy. say was, <laughs> do it again. <laughs> so you wanted to have a second of uh, asking, and then you said yes. But I mean, that was definitely like, you know, divine relationship um, start building. And I think it just is, um, synonymous for what happens in Egypt when you're in Egypt and if you travel in a group that is you know having a focus a focus and uh, an attention to all the the magic that happens there there is just a co-creation itself what occurs and uh, and often with our groups they are just transformational shifts happening that are not really possible uh, in such a short amount of time when you are in your day to day life. And it is not just, you know, the the magic of the country. It is really also that uh, that group dynamic. You know, we are sailing down the Nile. We are, you know, together doing uh, meditations, doing, uh, you know, work together. We have the temples um, and and really work also there with the energies available. And then, you know, you form relationships just there. Some of those relationships are lifelong friends. And so it's, it's an incubation chamber that I find always leads to something so big that when you're there, you don't necessarily understand the ripple effects that it will have years and years and years afterwards for you and and so that's what i love about uh, the way we are inviting uh, people to join us to egypt that it is not just hey let's look at the pyramids it is really let's evolve let's have an intention and everyone who feels called usually feels called from deep within it's not like, oh, yeah, that sounds like a nice vacation. It's more like, no, I need to go. This is calling me because there is on a soul level, these people, this journey, this time exactly right for me to make that quantum leap. And so if you feel called to make a quantum leap, whether it's in your relationship with yourself or with others or with the divine, I mean, listen to that calling because it definitely is there for a reason. I mean, my calling to go to Egypt didn't exist. I was simply, you know, the, the one who was carrying the bags for Danielle when we did the first time. Uh -huh. <laughs> but once I was there, and once I really felt, you know, just the presence of these energies, and there are some places where you just cannot explain why it is so deeply profounding moving and uh, why there is just something that you tap into that lasts it's almost like you are you know in a in the presence of a magnet and something inside of your lines that you have felt disaligned with for such a long time and that was certainly for me 
in several of those places uh, happening. And, and one of them certainly is Philae, the, the Temple of Isis, where you just enter into this temple. And often we had this in the morning and it was, you know, really just beautiful, the sun rising and you feel a sweetness, you feel a, a love of the mother, you feel a love that maybe you have been missing since your childhood or even before. And that is so healing and so nourishing. Most people leave the temple with with tears of joy and gratitude that there is some something in their heart that has always either felt like a void or like a wound something has been healing and and that is just something that you have to experience because otherwise you won't believe it for yourself <laughs> yes and you know what comes to mind is isis obviously is present here as we're talking about relationships and loving and uh you know i have the temples of light book where Isis's story is touched on a little bit and how, you know, Isis built a temple everywhere where she found a dismembered part of her beloved Osiris and uh, that the journey through the temples along the Nile is really this remembering the bringing back together into a state of wholeness and that, you know, I really sense like we've gone a dozen or more times with groups. Uh, I really sense the energies of 2024 is that the group that's gathering is is really there to tap into even more um, divine aspects of pioneer innovating, uh, like Isis can be in in the the divine mother form and yet she can also be connected in a stellar way to Sirius to uh Satet Sotes uh, so that as above so below or like the pyramids are built as a reflection the great pyramid at Giza the three pyramids are built as a reflection of Orion's belt at a certain time when they were built so it does really feel like we're there to gather to, and I think that's something that's very different about the way that we co-create. Like, yes, we're co-leading and we're guiding, and yet we're not looking for followers. We recognize that those that journey with us have a piece of the puzzle, that you have your own wisdom, your own sovereignty, your own gifts and talents, and, and magic, and that we open things for each other. And so I really sense that it's like we're tapping into together even more um, untapped energies like that there's the hieroglyphs and we can understand the hieroglyphs. And yet at the same time, like the, the light language of the hieroglyphs, the love language of the hieroglyphs. So uh, in even more, uh, yeah, that it just feels like there's going to be new keys and codes and uh, bodies of works and ceremonies that we bring in that will really be in response to the asking and the calling of those particular energies. So let's talk about the Egyptian people because, you know, when we first started going to Egypt, and I know we, we did different uh, projects, like where we would go to orphanages and help with the kids. And I remember being like, wow, you know, uh, I really want to help more. And then our missions are so much about like helping folks in the Western world. And like that there may be also different levels of, of uh, financial poverty. And yet I feel like the Egyptians are so relationship rich. Like they model so much love, laughter, open heartedness, where like I felt like I'd had a lack of that growing up in the States and how we live all separate in our houses. So what would you say about the Egyptian people and, and the folks that we travel with and, and how that just adds to the whole journey? Well, I think the first thing you hear from the Egyptians is welcome home. And so they invite you home because, you know, the Egyptian uh, civilization is, uh, you know, you could say the the womb of the, you know, the world society is at least is how the Egyptians see it. And uh, 
and it feels like coming home. So you always feel welcome. You always feel that there is a smile that you receive. And, and you're right, we did also go to houses uh, of, uh, of Egyptians that invited us for a tea or a little snack in little villages as we were cruising down the Nile. And there's just an openness and a friendliness and a curiosity. You know, there are millions and millions of people going to Egypt every year. And you would say, well, at some point they are probably a little jaded or tired of all these tourists, but not at all. It's just there is a, as a pride of the Egyptians that we come to see all these amazing things that their you know, ancestor has been building and that pride makes them also really be generous and open. And, uh, and you're right with each other. They are also very hard open. And of course, you know, Egyptians also hunk their horns in traffic and certainly have their times when they are fighting. They are humans after all. But there is a there is a humor and a lightness that I always admire about the Egyptians, and uh, and that is something that is not necessarily with all people that I met. And you, as you said, they are not uh, many of them are rather poor and uh, and struggling, but they still have always time to, you know, have a joke or talk or ask questions and. And, and are just much more about the interpersonal and human connection than about how can we, you know, have more or, you know, consume more. It's, that is certainly something that, especially in the countryside, is, is a beautiful experience and uh, something that I also always look forward to come back to because it hasn't changed and uh, I hope it won't. As our Egyptologist often says, you know, like when you go down the Nile, you pretty much has a, have a look into times uh, or into the way of living during biblical times. And that's how people still do live in many ways. And that that simplicity and that connection to the to the Nile and to the earth and to the plants and the animals, that in itself is a divine relationship that many of us have lost. You know, many of us have lost the relationship to the divine in nature. And so that is also something that I find we can remember and reconnect when we're there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one other thing, well, two things I still want to talk about, and I know we could have like eight episodes here, uh, you know, but one is that you talked about earlier on which is like how when you go to Egypt, you come home and you're just different. And and I remember like this feeling of like, uh, maybe one of our uh, co-travelers said this, where it was like the genie's out of the bottle and it's not going back in the bottle. <laughs> uh, so I'd love to talk a little bit more about, yeah, just the changes that we've seen in folks that have traveled with us. And then also, the the group comes together for a reason and the magic that happens from traveling together in a group that is there for transformation so are there any stories that are coming to mind for you for yourself or uh, for others that have traveled with us that have been that transformation I mean I know I'm thinking too of just like the lifelong communities like some folks they meet and then they're having Christmas together or celebrating holidays or uh just all the the long-term connections that have been built from sharing a journey like this together yeah and I mean you know it's wonderful when you share the love for Egypt and its magic and then people feel called to lead their own tours to Egypt which has been several that just feel like you know what I want to share this with my uh, people and my groups and my family. So that has been also an enormous ripple effect. But I think on a personal level, I just find that so many people that come back from these tours do feel that they have a greater awareness of the of the divine and the symbology and the synergies in life than ever before. So there is it's almost like an anchoring in trust, which I really needed, you know, as I said before. And, uh, and when you come back and you realize everything has a reason and there are signs that can point you in the direction of your journey and there are ways that 
the divine is communicating with you that you may have ignored or dismissed before. So there are these uh, stories of people just feeling like they're they're really in a in a much greater awareness of what is their mission, what is their purpose, what is the direction of their journey, and therefore have changed their jobs, have you know started their own healing businesses, have written books, have you know just done amazing work that then you know just really they are leading back to this catalytic function of being in egypt and you know often they say if they would have not been in egypt they would have not really discovered that treasure within and uh, so it's it's fun to go there and realize you are so much more than you ever thought you are and you have such a gift inside of you that you haven't really been able to see and now you're ready to unpack it Mm. Yeah, and I often say that, like the you know when we go to the airport to meet everyone, it's like uh, you know a holiday, and and I, I can't wait for the gifts, and that everyone's the gift, and that we get to unwrap each other, and it's also just so beautiful our own transformation, but then to also witness and just like see everyone fall in love with themselves and uh, have a deeper connection to intuition and guidance, which I think is what you're talking about. And, uh, and then just, we laugh and cry and, uh, dance and, and have these really special experiences. I love that too, that we have a private, uh, sailing yacht just for our group. So we can really also stay in the energies and, uh, and have the space to have circles and to talk and to integrate and, of course, eat amazing food. And, uh, yeah, it just also really feels like that integration, of daily life and our connection to the temples and that we're just weaving back and forth all the time from uh, sharing a meal to having an amazing meditation to buying a scarf or, you know, like all those things. And it's just really special, of course, Friedman to share with you and to be able to bring together your amazing work uh, with your foundation, of course, uh, and all that you've done with science and cardiology and molecular biology, and then all the years of mind-body connection, hypnotherapy, timeline therapy, neuro-linguistic programming, and then you know, I'm bringing the channeling and the guides and, uh, and just that blend too of the masculine, and the feminine, uh, really coming together in sacred union. So uh, if you're feeling called to explore joining us to Egypt, we'll have a link in the show notes for you to reach out and, uh, and also just share with us a little bit, like what excites you about coming so we can explore together if like what you're looking for and what Egypt has to offer is really an aligned match. So thank you so much for tuning in. Any final words you want to say before we hop off here? Well, I just feel like it's the greatest gift that you can give yourself in 2024 and maybe in your entire life to, to have this time in this special place and with a special uh, intention and really feel like, you know, I am ready to create this next level of relationships with myself and others. And, and then picture yourself sitting in this private sailing yacht, having a cup of coffee in the morning and just watching this beautiful land go by as you're sailing down the Nile and just know, wow, you will have a complete different relationship to time. That's something we haven't mentioned, but it's, you know, maybe a two week trip and you feel like it's a month or six weeks and not because you're bored out of your mind, but because it's just such a <laughs> amazing, full, rich experience that every day feels like three days. And uh, so that's also something where the distortion of time is so amazing when you're there that you really come back and you feel like, wow, I was gone for a month. And uh, mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it's another part of that magic of Egypt. Yeah. And you shared that like a quantum, a quantum leap and we'll be there for Valentine's day and, um, and my birthday too. So Very it's important. really, uh, <laughs> you know, to me, a journey of divine family, uh, soul family that we gather together with those that are really aligned to join us. 
Well, thank you, beloved, for being on the podcast, for co-creating with me, and thank you for tuning in to Manifesting Divine Relationships with the support of the energies of Egypt and the heart opening that can happen as well from sacred travel. Hi, Dr. Friedman here. Thank you for tuning into my YouTube channel. If you're interested in learning more about fear and anxiety, here you'll find guided meditations, webinars, and interviews with some of the most renowned experts in the field of empowerment. Delve into the over 230 videos and more to come every week.